Father, we thank you for the brothers who have come today to make this message available and music available for all the people a pleasant rain. All the glory belongs to you. Thank you for life and health, even in the midst of this coronavirus. We plead the blood of Jesus that you would give medical personnel the answer that indeed you have all the healing power and we glorify you. We pray for our families. We thank you for the entire Pleasant Green family and even those who will join with us throughout America and yea, even around the world. Tuning in, pleasantchurch.org. We bless you for the technology and how it allows us to connect with a larger audience. Even as the facility is closed, the church is still open. Give me a word today, anointed Holy Spirit, and give it life that someone would believe the report, that someone would say, I want to come on the Lord's side. Let me decrease that Christ would increase. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Save, strengthen, add to the body, build up every believer. Do it all today in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people say it, Amen. Amen. Again, Heavenly Father, use me now. Thank you for the privilege of standing in this sacred space. All glory belongs to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Friends, we are here today again with a message from the Lord. And I want you to get your Bible so that you can pay attention and follow along. I am convinced that this is a message that can make a difference in your life. As you're going through, as we're going through this season of sadness, the numbers keep piling up, cases keep piling up, deaths are recorded. And there does not seem to be an answer. But I want you to get your Bible because the Lord put a message on my heart. It's drawn from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Beginning with verse 18 and following. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord Jesus, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. As God gives direction, this Luke chapter 7 text lends itself to you and I at this time in our lives. 
how to lift the subject, the deconstruction of doubt. Deconstruction of doubt. Deconstruction means the analysis, the breaking down, the breaking apart of a concept, a notion, an idea. Deconstruction is the opposite of construction. And today, by the leading of God's Holy Spirit, I want to break down doubt. What happens in the psyche when you and I start doubting? We are in the midst of a terrible global pandemic. And many people around the world are doubting the power, the presence, the provision of our Heavenly Father. And maybe you're having moments, moments of doubt where you wonder, God has all this power. Why would God not stop the virus? Why would he allow these cases to pile up? Why would he allow family members and friends to be infected by the virus? And then some are drawn home to be with the Lord. And doubt is temporary. But doubt, listen carefully, needs to be brought to the heavenly Father. Now, in this passage, we are dealing with an unusual source of doubt. Let me see if I can make my case. John the Baptist. John, not a skeptic, not some cynic, not some atheist, not some agnostic. This is John. And John the one who had said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, John chapter 1, verse 29, is now saying, Are you the one? Or should we look for another? If John the Baptist could have doubt in his heart and in his mind and in his spirit, I want to submit to you that any one of us, even as we have walked with Christ, when circumstances change, our external situation changes, many times we give off a rash expression of doubt, a little question mark. Now, I need to add to my argument that this is the job who even before he was born, in his mother's womb, gave praise unto God. This is the John who said, there stands in our midst, as he was baptizing at the Jordan, one who is greater than I, and I am not worthy to even unloose his sandals. This is the John who said, I must decrease so that he could increase. This is the same John. This is not someone on the outside. This is John saying, I've got some doubts. And praise be to God, I, I alluded to it a moment ago. John took his doubts to Jesus Christ. And I would say to you, if you have a moment of doubt, take it to our Savior and you will discover that he can handle our doubts. He can handle our question marks. He can handle our being confounded and troubled. Perhaps you have a job that's in jeopardy. Perhaps you have an ailment, and as they discuss the symptoms of this virus, Sometimes, otherwise healthy people will start feeling some quasi-symptoms. But I want you to hold on to your faith. 
child of God, this is the moment when your faith in God is being tested. But I believe you are more than a conqueror. I believe that through Christ, you know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Well, what happened that John started out saying, this is the one. And now John is saying, are you the one? The first proposition I want to put before you is the report. Now, during that day and time, there was no internet. There was no evening news. Let me catch up. Even prisoners today have access to the media. So they can catch up with the issues that are of the day. But John received reports from his disciples. And the reports were at variance with what John's conception of the Messiah should have been. John, like many of the people during his time, expected a political Messiah. One who would throw off the oppression of the Roman government. And the report came to John. Now, I want to believe, and based on this scripture, I want to believe John's disciples editorialized, embellished, added to. I believe one of the disciples of John would say, I heard he was in Capernaum the other day. And another one would say, well, I heard he was in Galilee the other day. And then they say, well, some of the people he hangs around are people of questionable background. So as they added this report together, it caused John to say, hmm, maybe he's not the one. Number one, the report. Here it is, we learn in our children's church. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Because sources are as important as the statements they share. So number one, the report. Doubt can come when people who don't really walk with God start speaking in your ear. Be careful whose report you listen to. If a person is not spiritual, if a person is not biblically based, if a person does not have an active prayer life, a worshiping life, a life of obedience to God, then that might be a person you need to tune out because they will add to your doubt. Now, he's already in prison. I forgot to tell you that he's in the prison of Macarius. Macarius. It's a fortress that Herod Antipas built for special prisoners. Now, the background of all of this, how did John get into prison? Well, John spoke out against Herod's moral indiscretions. I'm not gossiping, but Herod married his brother's wife. And John said, Herod, it's not right. Another day rolled around, and maybe John the Baptist positioned himself underneath the palace windows so that Herod could hear him. And every day he said the same thing. Herod, you remember I told you the other day it's not right, but it's still not right. And Herod, God is not pleased with your behavior. For that crime, Herod put John into Macaras fortress, prison, dungeon. And so all John could do was to receive reports from his disciples. And again, I say it again, they embellished, they editorialized, they added to it, they augmented the message. And you understand, here is a part of it. 
Now, John, you're in prison, and the one you spoke of, greater than you, is free. John, that ain't right. And you know, there are people who can speak negativity into your life and cause you to really get out of sorts. You can start speaking things that you never would have spoken if not for the suggestions of people who are not walking with God. Here is how you can determine a report you ought to believe. Is it my God shall make a way? Is it that you hear from another person, brother, sister, cousin, church member, influential person in the community, our God has this virus in control. Now you gotta watch the sources that you receive reports from. So now we get to the request. Are you the one? And they rudely come in and break up whatever Jesus was doing before they arrived. And they just came in and just bum rushed. Are you the one? You know what bum rush means, just rude and lewd. Are you the one? John sent us to ask you, are you the one? Now, I don't believe John was trying to confront Jesus because John already knew, but they had so filled his mind with doubt that John sends two of his disciples with, number two, a request. Are you the one? And this is a plaintive cry. This is a heartfelt. This is a heartbreak. Are you the one? In other words, John is saying, I need to put my request in now because I can already hear the blade being sharpened as Herod's men are preparing to take my head off. Now, if you've been to Sunday school and Bible student, you know that Herodias' daughter danced in a banquet setting, and John with and, and Herod with some inebriation said before all of these people, whatever you want, daughter. And her mother had put her up to ask for John's head. So John knew just as his disciples had given him some reports on what Jesus was up to, there were reports coming from Herod's throne room. John, it looks bad for you, man. You better get your house in order. John, you ought to write your will. Write my will? Yeah, who do you want your loincloth to go to? Who do you want your camel hair to go to? Who do you want your scrolls to go to? Because John, it looks bad for you, man. So John sends these two with a request. Are you the one? John is exemplifying a broken heart. But a broken heart needs to be taken to the Lord Jesus. The same one who disappoints is the one who can lift us. So the request is made after the report, the request, a formal request, are you the one? Too much is at stake. John is saying, I need to know, will I get a return on my investment? From the beginning of John's life, he has been the forerunner. He has been the hype man. He has been the one going before the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I'm not the one, but he is coming behind me. And he has power to save. I can baptize you, but you need a baptism of God's Holy Spirit. And it can only come through an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll put a pin there and tell you, child of God, you need to hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. No matter what this virus does, no matter how many people are cases and how it's spreading all around the world, my trust is in God's power. 
I learned the game. A lot of these songs I learned as a child. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got me and you, brother, in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. I've gone on to college. I've gone on to seminary. I've read many books. But I cannot find a better theological revelation than the fact that in troubling times, we need to recognize God, our Heavenly Father, has the whole world in his hands. So John says there is, time is running out. Time. John says, I gotta put in my request now while I'm alive so that I can get an answer to my question. So number one, the report. Number two, the request. Number three, let's see what Jesus has as a reply. Jesus says, come here, come here now. I want you all to take a message back to John and tell John this time, don't add to the report. This time, don't put your thoughts into it. This time, your opinions don't matter because right now, I am healing. Right now, in real time, Jesus is raising up bowed down heads Jesus is opening the eyes of the blind. You remember that blind man from last week? He said, put that in the record. Put that in the report. Now, take a full report. Tell John the truth and nothing but the truth. Because evidently what you've been telling John has caused him. This is not a question I would expect from John. John and I are related. Now you got to go back to Luke chapter 1 to get the relationship because John's mother, Elizabeth, was pregnant with John during the time Mary, the virgin, was pregnant with Jesus, our Savior. And when Mary approached Elizabeth, John's mother, the Bible says that the babe in, the, in Elizabeth's womb, John, leaped in vitro praise. John Praise the, was, was a praiser from the womb. You're talking about I've been a praiser since I was a child. John was a praiser in the womb. John starts saying glory, hallelujah, in the womb. So his reply is tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. Don't add to it this time. Give John the truth. Because if John hears the truth, he can accept the inevitable which will happen. Now, certainly Jesus had power to stop John from being uh, beheaded by hell. That's why I don't understand all of the ways of God, and neither do you. But I trust him when I can't trace him. I trust his hand when I can't trace his I trust his heart when I can't trace his hand. I know he looks out for us. I know he watches over us. During this time when we've been homebound, during this time when we have wondered where our financial support will come from. In other words, when the media goes to people and interviews people, what are you gonna do if you can't work? I don't know, but I don't wanna go to work and get sick. So you've got that problem because you need the economics, but you're also concerned about your health and safety. So what do you do? They've never come up with an answer. And the answer is we're going to social distance. The answer is we're going to put on masks. The answer is we're going to uh, trace all of the people we have talked to or come in contact with in the last three weeks. And even the test, trust me on this one, even the test is a moment in time test. You can be negative today and positive next week. Because again, it's for that moment I'm negative. Now, trust me, Google it. If you don't believe me, Google it. Because you're not negative for the rest of your life. You're negative in the moment you were tested when they put that swab up your nose. Or now, I think they perfected some of the testing. But the point I'm making is, 
You and I are healed by God's word. And if God does not heal us, he has a greater purpose in mind. Some healing is when God calls a child of God home. No more sadness. No more sorrow. No more weeping. No more wailing. But the idea is that there is a report that comes in. There is a request that is made. There is a reply. Then let's look at this idea of reality. Because verse 21 indicates that at that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. That's the word. All I have is the word. Jesus says, now, go tell John that right now, in real time, Jesus is healing. In real time, he's curing people of their diseases. In real time, can I ask you a question? What is God doing in your right now? If God is not causing healing to come in the world, is God holding your mind together right now? Without alcohol, without substance, God is just whispering in your spirit, everything is going to be all right. We look in vain in the 21st century for physical healing, but I'm so glad that God heals minds, hearts, and spirits, and those are in the invisible realm of life. More is going on in the invisible than in the visible realm. So he says, at that time, the reality. But let me close it up by telling you he rebukes whoever doubts. That's verse 23. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. I like that. Bless he who takes no offense at me. Offense means to be tripped up. So let me give the, the college a version. Bless is he who does not trip. When I was a teenager, they'd say, you tripping. And that was in the 70s. But even today, People are tripping out. Believers are tripping out. Saints of God are tripping out. I've never heard such negativity coming from the body of Christ. I've never heard people who give over to the public officials all of the understanding of what's going on. This is not a physical matter. This is a spiritual matter. And until we consult with our Heavenly Father, we will be going around in circles trying to find an answer. The answer is, blessed is he who does not take offense, who does not trip over me. Jesus says to us, you need to bring your doubts to me. Don't trip. Don't trip. You can't handle this. This is spiritual. This is in another realm. This is at a higher level. You and I operate down here at our understanding level. And God operates way up here at a level that we cannot understand. Let's see if the Bible affirms what I'm saying. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So what can I say? Well, I close out by saying you need some substantive song during your doubting days. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Here is one. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Hold him. If the world from you withhold all its silver and its gold, 
and you have to get along with meager fare. He says, if he feeds the little bird, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Well, let me see if I have another one. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadow come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. I'm, I'm singing or, or mouthing the words, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Even in the midst of the virus, I have never before felt the comforting presence of God. And it's going to be all right, child of God. It's going to be all right. Hold on to your doubts and take them to the Lord and trust Him and leave your burden with the Lord. Don't go back at it. Don't. If you give it to Him, give it to Him one time and tell Him, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I'm covering my mouth. Lord, I'm trying to cough in my elbow. Lord, I'm washing my hands. Lord, I'm fearful of the spread of this virus, but tell him about it. When you start talking about it to other people, they say, yeah, I got some masks. Can I just give one little joke? I, I know I ought to be concluding. But the bank robbers are having trouble now because there are no masks. But let me close out the message on a spiritual note. You and I need to take our doubts to our Heavenly Father. And when you take your doubt to the Heavenly Father, He gives you a declaration for your doubt. David, on one occasion, says, I've been young, now I'm older, but yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I want to echo David, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen God abandon His children. Now, the end of the story, he said, what did you all go out to see? Did you all go out to see a reed shaken? John was a strong reed. Anybody could have doubted if they heard the report that John heard without any other substantive counter knowledge. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Those who are splendidly clothed, I'm reading verse 25, and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? He's talking about John. A prophet, yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. He said, John may have doubted, but John is still on the Lord's side. And John is going to his grave knowing I am the one. I am the one. Anybody know he's the one? He's the one. Yes, he is. He's the one. Call on him. He is the one. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. He is the one. I have searched all over for a spiritual connection. And I have not found any other name whereby we must be saved. Scripture interprets scripture. So in Acts chapter 4, the reference is, there is salvation in no other name save the name of Jesus. Can I get it one more time? The name of Jesus. He is the one. Tell John. Take this back to John. Take this back. Some people, when you get a message, you ought to give a message. When you get a when you receive a report, you ought to send a report back. So tell John this. Tell John I am the one. Tell John he made the right choice. Tell John that I'm healing. Tell John I am the Messiah. Tell John that I am. Strong. 
Tell John I am mighty. Tell John that I saved to the uttermost. Tell John. Oh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your only son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place on the cross. And he took your place. He is the one. He is the one. Education cannot do what an encounter with God's only begotten son. Economics cannot do. Entertainment cannot do. All of these pale in comparison to saying yes to Jesus. And I want to give you that opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus. Lord, save me today. Forgive me today. Take control of my life today. I want you to own me as your child. Cleanse me, wash me. I want eternal life. I want to live with you forever when I die. I need you. I open my heart to you in the name of Jesus. If that prayer epitomized your yearning, you are now a child of God. Welcome to the family of God. And when all of this is over, I want you to come and be a part of Pleasant Green Church. We affectionately call ourselves the Pleasant Church. Not to cast aspersion on any other fellowship. But wouldn't you like to be a part of a Pleasant Church where we pray for one another, where we worship, where we revere the Word of God, where we submit to pastoral leadership, where we love one another, where we give of our tithes, where we work in ministry, where we uplift the community, and where you can be a vital part of a good fellowship through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, it's Lord's Supper observance, and I want to lead us in our Lord's Supper observance. We will read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whosoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of sleep. For if we judged ourselves right, rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Thus reads 1 
Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord's Supper. Greater than communion, greater than sacrament, we call it the Lord's Supper. In those last days before he went to the cross, he had a last supper with his disciples. Well, Pastor, we know it's the Lord's the Lord Supper, but we just kind of traditionally call it communion. Communion is praying. Communion is talking to the Lord. The Lord's Supper leaves no ambiguity about what you're dealing with. The Lord's Supper. So together with our families, we eat of the bread and drink of the juice. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want you to hear the music which is appropriate to the Lord's Supper. And I want you, when all the clear is announced, to be right here at Pleasant Green. We'll send out information over the website. Somebody will give you the official notice. Pleasant Green and all of the churches are back to worship. Will you pray with me for the hastening of that? I don't want anyone to put their lives in jeopardy. Let's listen to the health officials. Let's stay in and let's cover our mouths with masks. Let's go get tested at your private, your employer, your private physician, your clinic, your hospital. And even when we're open, we will practice social distancing. Even when we come back, some people can sit in the pews on the main floor, some people can be up in the balcony, some people can be behind me in the choir loft. I hope and pray that we'll have so many people that we will not be able to accommodate everyone. And when we go through something as challenging as this, I pray that wherever you're hearing this message, you will find a Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-exalting, people-loving church. I know of no better church than Pleasant Green Baptist Church, Kansas City, Kansas. To God be the glory. Amen.